evening. Good evening. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Good. Very well. Uh, what's news? Talk to me. I've just been thinking about what has happened with workplace etiquette and proper means of communicating. You mean courtesy and emails? Primarily. I mean, phone manner is one thing, which is probably a topic for another conversation, but particularly the ability of people to string full sentences together in written form has clearly gone the way of the dodo. This is the degradation of the written expression in the age of email through mobile phone devices and so on? I would say 80% of the emails I receive or or send during the day are sent from my desk, from a computer, and the person on the other end is doing the same. So there's no excuse for typos sent from the train, sent from the back of a cab or something on the way to a meeting. There's no sent from iPhone signature block at the end as the excuser. No, that's right. We've all sent typos on a text message and automatically translated to some completely different meaning word. You try and type the word fuck and it comes out as duck or freak. Yeah, happens to me a lot. So what's your complaint? Is your complaint about the lack of punctuation or lack of courtesy, the brevity? Probably the over-familiarity. So a colleague in a large company who you've never met, you've been asked to step in to help them with a problem and it's you get greeted with, hey, you mean H-E-Y? Yeah. Really? Yeah. This is a professional person in a yeah. suit yeah. who's greeting you with a hey. Hey, I know if, I know this things happen and, you know, this has happened, but hey, here's what you need to know. Cheers. Okay. Well, let's break that down. First of all, let's break through the opening greeting and the closing farewell mm. because I think they're a bit different. It's like the shit sandwich of email where you start off with the white bread casual and you mm. end with the white bread informal or casual, and then you have the formal or the shitty bit in between. The pastrami in the middle. Yeah. Now, I think that hi and dear, I think are almost interchangeable with many people today. They are different. Like, dear is clearly more formal. But hey, to me, that's definitely a text or WhatsApp or instant message or Facebook comment type greeting. I think hey is- Extremely informal. And recently I was solving the problem for someone and I got greeted with a hey. I'd never spoken to this person before and I asked them to send me how they had informed the client of the error that had occurred and the email they forwarded me, they're addressing the client as hey. So how old's this particular person? I don't know. I'm guessing they're mid-20s, late-20s. I don't know. Maybe younger. But I was shocked. I was like... Who would email a client as, hey, yeah, the thing I've seen before wasn't meant for you. It's an error. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Send it back. Cheers. And then they email me like, oh, yeah, here's that thing. Hey, man, here's that thing you wanted. It's like, what? Are we at the skate park? Are we like 12 years old? Like, what's going on here? See, maybe it's the old cranky man, get off my lawn inside me. But I am cringing when I hear that. I've got a little bit of Clint Eastwood Gran Turismo. I mean, don't get me wrong, but... Um, also a bit of Gran Torino or just Gran Turismo, the computer game? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you seen the uh, EA Sports movie <laughs> with Big Clint? Yeah, he's basically sitting in a Corvette on his lawn with a shotgun. <laughs> Gran Turismo. Just shooting randomly at various <laughs> WRXs driving past. I have spent so much time in arcades playing Gran Turismo that um, <laughs> it's old habits die hard. The Oscar-nominated <laughs> Gran Turismo. Now, it's funny, isn't it, that I am a literature Nazi in relation to proper grammar, proper spelling, just professional courtesy. Mm. And the reason why that is, it isn't because I am a Nazi in relation to written expression for the sake of it. To me, it reflects on the professionalism of the sender and the recipient. And also, if I read something written with, hey, yo, cheers, I question the integrity or accuracy of the content. It's like you're not thinking this whole thing through from the skin, the written expression, to the content. I'm not being picky, but you see a semicolon when you should see a colon or you see Things with capital letters when they don't need to be in capital letters. And you just go, okay, let's take a look at this for one short minute and just go, this is a just a huge hot mess of shit. Like, just let's just pair this back to how we learned to write things when we were 12 years old. Just go, dear sir, new paragraph, capital letter, comma, full stop, 
colon, new line, indent, subparagraph. Like, how hard is it? Do you know what I mean? And you're absolutely right because you actually can use correct grammar yet still sound casual. You can can actually even write, hey, insert name, comma, line break, et cetera, and include like so, comma, name, comma, and so on. Yeah. And still sound like it's a very casual conversation, but at the same time it's at least adhering to the basic tenets of correct English grammar. And what's your sign-off? Thanks or are you a- B or C or whatever your initial might oh, be. Oh, wow. Okay. So, or- you have just either coincidentally or you know me too well, you've just touched on two foundations of my farewells that I've kind of finessed in the last five years of my 15-year professional working life. As in you've been working on them for a while? No. As time's gone on, I've kind of finessed what I think is the perfect most generic response suitable to most people. It covers most situations without me having to try and tailor in a bespoke fashion a very well thought out farewell to every individual person. So, long story sh- yeah, go on. So, it's easier for you. You don't have to put too much thought into yeah. it. So, what I found about five years ago, I was doing the regards, the best regards and cheers as different alternates as farewells to people in written correspondence, namely email. But about six years ago, I transitioned to a single response that I'll give to potentially anyone from a CEO right through to a person on the low end of the hierarchy in a business. It's thanks, comma, new line, my name. And that way, what I find is that the thanks is doing double work. It's saying thanks, like it's being sincere. It's a bit cash, but it's formal enough. The people who expect respect, you're saying thank you. The people who are casual, it's informal enough. And so I use that now almost everywhere, except outside the workplace. I use usually best regards. And then after the sort of third email in that same correspondence chain, I'll just drop the regards and do best, comma, and any new person I meet who's a professional in my work job, I start with best regards. You start with best regards instead of thanks? Yeah. And then I earn my way to either best, comma, on my name, or once you, thanks, comma. Once you work up a level of familiarity. With a stranger, I will start with, let's say it's, I don't know, let's say it's a bank manager or someone I don't even know, but someone who I want to make sure I sound professional with. Hmm. Not that I have ever emailed a bank manager, but let's say it's someone who, whose respect you want to garner. I will do best regards because I've always found regards sounds too formal and to me it feels too cold. But how do you start the email? Do you go, Daniel, the thing you sent me before was wrong for these reasons, but here you go, here's another version. Thanks. Okay. Without being judgmental, I have never in my life started an email with someone's name, like Daniel, comma, so-and-so. To me, personally, it feels too abrupt. And when I read an email from someone, I take it as, you. <laughs> so I always start it as, hi, name, comma, new line. Or I'll say, thanks, Daniel, full stop, and then I'll respond. And the thanks can be sincere or can be passive-aggressive, where hmm. I think they're being an arsehole, but I'll kill them with kindness and say, Thanks, Daniel, for your email. When in truth, I actually aren't thanking them at all. They've just been an arsehole, but I'm just trying to be nicer than not. And then I will then correct them or be firmer in some regard. But thanks for your email is usually my written equivalent of, with all respect, dot, dot, dot. How about you? For a long time, I've done the whole name, thank you, blah, 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 blah. Every email is name, new line. Thank you. Stop. New line. Here's why you're a fuckwit. Or here's why I have to do all this extra work because you're a fuckwit. But, yeah, so it's either the thanks at the end, as you say, or the thank you at the beginning. Either way, you get your thanks and go away and fucking do it. So I assume thank you is the harsher version of thanks. Yeah, so as you said, it's the passive-aggressive kicker at the start. And it sort of puts the reader in their place and lets them know who's boss. But on any, I guess, judgmental view, 
you go, oh, well, he did say thank you. <laughs> so You know, I always think I want to ensure that if the emails are printed off and provided in a court of law or escalated to their boss or my boss, they could read them out and if you read them literally as is, there's nothing possibly incriminating or too emotional or hostile or even relaxed. It's the bare facts and it's about riding that line between being professional and courteous and convivial. And that's why I love doing the kill them with kindness routine because the other person knows that you're a bit pissed off and they know you've been passive aggressive. But in the cold light of day when those words are read out in a court of law, it reads as being courteous. It looks perfectly reasonable, if not. Even more so. Yeah. yeah. It's like you're being entirely understanding and appreciative. And I always think the reader would read that email and go, man, he could have said, fuck off, you asshole. But he's actually gone the other way when he didn't have to. And so it kind of gives you credit. What do you think about the whole, Stephen, I hope you've had a great weekend. New line. Please see attached. Blah, blah, blah. So you mean the email foreplay? It's generally either I hope you have a good day or I hope you had a good weekend or I hope you did have a good weekend or will have a good weekend or slash. Okay. Well, don't judge me for this, but I'm a big proponent of How's your Thursday going? So, yeah, yeah, look, I I do it a lot because what happens is in my job when I'm the bearer of bad news, if I just go in cold, without saying too crude, there's no foreplay. Yeah. So, I essentially have to basically lubricate the Jared, conversation. Jared Haynes style, no kissing. <laughs> so, my thoughts are that I kind of add that to the column of kill them with kindness. And I know they may see through it as why does he care about my weekend or why does he care about my day? But I just figure, well, the worst case scenario is they'll say, oh, he's asking about something superfluous to the conversation. But the best case scenario, which is worth more than the worst case scenario, is they'll go, oh, that's nice. And my theory is that most people are most interested in themselves and like to be heard and like to feel good about themselves. So if I figure, if I go in, let's say four out of five people go, oh, that's nice. He asked about about my weekend or he wished me a good weekend at the end. And the one in five think, oh, why does he give a shit about my weekend? The four out of five outweigh the one in five. It's like the classic, what are you going to do on the weekend? Said to a colleague on a Friday afternoon. All you want in response is, oh, not much, going to play a game of golf. Oh, yeah, good on you. It should be fun. Weather should be nice. Yeah, take it easy. Okay, bye. What you don't want is the whole, well, actually, I'm going to do this, this, and this. I'm going to do that and that. I'm going to do the washing and put the clothes out. (laughs) I'm going to take the kids to this. And then you don't want that. No, totally. Did, totally. did I on the Monday? Yeah. How was your weekend? Yeah, not bad. Thanks to yourself. Yeah, not too bad. Okay, walk on. Not, how was your weekend, mate? Oh, mate, yeah, it's fucking great. Do this and that. Yeah, more than walk on, yeah. jog on. Yeah, yeah. To me, it's about the social awareness to know where you are. Let's say you're in the kitchenette at yeah. work. It's small talk. It's in and the lift. You're opening the, okay. So, basically, you time the response to the perceived <laughs> duration of the environment. Yeah. So a lift is a 30 second oh, answer. I, w- I, I don't even talk to people in lifts. Right. I wouldn't even. I'll see someone I know perfectly well. I'll, I'll smile and go, Hi, I've seen you. I acknowledge that you work with me. I'll wait till we get off on the same floor and we'll have a three second chat as you open the door for me as we go into work. That's yeah. it. I agree. I'd prefer to That's it. give a promising big smile that leaves them wanting more than the chit-chat in the awkward lift environment where everyone feels a bit confined to speak to candidly. Nothing worse than the chatty lift guy or the chatty lift guy who just talks to people who work on other floors for different companies. That's even worse. Yeah, that's a violation of privacy. Oh, how about this lift, eh? Gee, it goes pretty slow, doesn't it? Oh, like who wants to try and make small talk with that guy? I've got an expression for the duration that conversation should be extended to. I call it the Jaffa line conversation. Or the microwave meal, where Ooh, that's, I mean, that's, we're talking four minutes there. Totally. So basically, when someone puts their food in the microwave or in a Jaffa line or presses the button on the hot milk frother or the Nespresso machine, it's fair to assume that the conversation, including a response and maybe a response to the response, oh. is about four minutes. Fully concluded and with like postscript editing done. 
by the time the 10 second warning comes on the microwave. Totally, totally. Yeah. I've got to say, I was actually a perpetrator in violating that rule today. <laughs> so I was doing a coffee at the place I'm working right now. I was using one of those AeroPress machines. Oh, wow. So they're quite yeah. big in America. They're meant to make the best, like, espresso without an espresso machine. Well, as reviewed by Amazon.com, yes, but don't forget, and apologies to our American listeners, but Americans who succeed and exceed in many fields objectively do not make great coffee. So the fact that Americans find the AeroPress machine to be fantastic is kind of compared to that huge kind of glass pot of coffee they normally consider to be oh, standard. Yeah. But isn't it just like really strong plunger coffee? It's plunger coffee, but without the benefits of the tamping process and the steam and so on that you get in a traditional espresso hmm. cafe machine. But so, From what I know of it, I bought a machine for my dad a few years ago. He never used it because he said, oh, it uses too much coffee. And it's too expensive. The impression I get is it's just, it's just like making yourself a really strong plunger coffee. Yeah, totally. Or what the Americans would call a French press. Yeah, AeroPress is essentially a cross between a French press and an espresso machine. It's not anything like an espresso, and it's not anything like a stovetop coffee. It's You're still using physical pressure to force coffee through beans, mm. and you're using hot water opposed to steam. But unlike a French press, you're doing it in one session. But unlike an espresso machine, you're not using steam to really push through those coffee beans. It so, tastes pretty good. So unlike a French press slash plunger, you're not waiting for the coffee to brew in the pot and then plunge it so that by then the coffee's got four minutes colder, you're doing it instantaneously with the hot water once the hot water goes in. Spot on. You only wait 30 seconds. You stir it or swirl it for 30 seconds and then you press down, but you press for about 30 to 45 seconds which is trying to replicate in a crude fashion the slow extraction you get with an espresso right. machine. And so for that 40 seconds, you were trying to have a full-blown conversation with a colleague about their weekend? Well, no, I was the violator because I was doing that. And he, had, and he I was making eggs for breakfast at, in the sort of workplace kitchenette. I mean, that's a whole other conversation as yeah. to who would do that. But yeah. anyway. There's a whole com- – let's, let's put a pin in that and return to that later on. The people who make – Breakfast, lunch, and dinner I mean, at their workplace. Are you camping out at work? Like, are you sleeping on, under your desk? Or what's we'll, going on? There? We'll return to this, but to give you a little teaser, a treat, a preview for the conversation. There are people in the place I'm working at right now that come to work with like $150 worth of groceries in plastic bags and 16 Lebanese cucumbers to last the next week. And they fill the fridge and then basically. Every day, get out the sharp knife, always the shitty, really blunt 1990s black plastic handled knife to cut their vegetables and make their salad for about 45 minutes at lunchtime to then consume over their desk. But again, we'll return to that. So I'm there today. I've done my little eggs in the microwave, which to me is the saddest way to make scrambled eggs. And I'm doing the little uh, AeroPress machine, and this fella in a suit goes, hey, what's that? And he's a Kiwi. And I said to him, oh, yada, 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 it's an AeroPress. People use them in camping in Australia, but they're quite popular overseas as a regular form of coffee consumption. And he then says in an unintentionally derogatory way, oh, yeah, I've seen people have those just for camping. <laughs> And then I say, oh, to try and sort of like crawl back some credibility, I said, no, 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 to be clear, I have a very, very expensive espresso machine at home. My brother-in-law is one of the most prominent coffee roasters in New Zealand that makes a fantastic boutique coffee. Please, I appreciate great caffeine. But today, for all sorts of shenanigan reasons, I've only got the... AeroPress to make it work. And I started explaining, justifying the situation because I was kind of embarrassed. And by the way, he's actually pressing the button on the Nespresso machine at the same time. So he's hardly a coffee snob or a coffee connoisseur. But I felt embarrassed to be using this camping-like plunging device. And I saw his face in real time go from 
genuine interest within about 30 seconds to, okay, I just heard that sound of the espresso machine finish. I want to grab my coffee and now exit this conversation. <laughs> I don't care about your brother-in-law. I don't care how good a roaster of beans he is in, you know, Napier or somewhere. <laughs> Upper Hutt or uh, Palmerston North, wherever he tends to work. <laughs> Shout out to those in Palmerston North. But, um, yeah, no, I agree. I do have the plunger in a thermos cup, the inbuilt plunger cup. Oh, work. that's a real camping that work, one. That is a real camping one, and it's pretty horrific. For a while there, I was taking my own coffee to work, and I would go and plunge it. But you got to plunge it in the kitchen because if you plunge it at your desk, it makes it sound like a fart. As you press it down, everyone goes, what the fuck was that? And you go, oh, it's just my, me and my camping <laughs> coffee plunger mug again. <laughs> so, you got to wait in the kitchen for five minutes what, before you do it. And yeah, it's like, really? And this time, I could have walked down the coffee shop, paid my $3 and come back up. So, so how many paid coffees do you buy per day? At least one, three times a week, probably two. So, two a day. So that's about- what, No, seven one and a half a day. One half a day. Okay, so that ends up being what's an average coffee in the CBD of Sydney? Three fifty-four. So you're looking at about six bucks per day. Hmm. Okay, so it's worth it if you can take the coffee camper plunger in at least for your afternoon tuple. But here's the thing: is that you'll read all these books today. Someone put me onto this latest bestseller called "Barefoot Investor" and yada 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 about how to save money here and there. And they talk about oh, imagine if you made your own coffee in a coffee plunger or a AeroPress every day. That's $30 per week times 50 weeks. That's $1,500, you know, you've saved. Here's the thing about all that sort of shit is that I think the cost of living in Sydney particularly, I'm sure it's the same in New York, Berlin, Tokyo, London, is so expensive that not buying that one, two coffees per day is not going to move the needle that much on your savings and if that coffee like saves you half an hour or gives you a walk and fresh air from work to clear your brain and fuck it you could basically take all that money and just spend two hours preparing a negotiation for your pay rise every year and be up on one and a half k yeah so to me it's a classic case of false economy like take that time and that coffee and earn a one and a half k by researching the stock market for two hours or doing something differently or just saying, everything you I do, will lose that money, but I'm happy with that because it gives me a degree totally. of joy. Everything you do costs money. And if I want to take a 20-minute break at 11 o'clock every day to walk across the street, see the guy at the coffee shop, say good day, have a bit of small talk, which I enjoy, as you say, get a bit of fresh air, work more productively for the rest of the day, I'm happy to pay $3 for the privilege of doing that. Think about how much it's worth in terms of mental health health or mental headspace. Yeah. For the exact same reason that on a weekend I've got six icy cold beers in the fridge, yet I will choose to walk 300 metres to a pub and have one on tap in a pub. Tastes the same, but sometimes you just want to have it where you want to have it, you know, like just have it your way. You're spot on. And, And it's not all about, it's not just all about a coffee hit. Otherwise, we'd all just be sitting at our desk drinking caffeine, eating caffeine tablets like truck drivers. It's not the caffeine hit. It's the the walk. It's the getting the lift. It's getting out from the desk, as you say, and, you know, walking down the stairs or walking through the lift. And same with the beer. It's like walking to the pub, seeing other people, small talk with the bartender, take the dog, which I like to do, sit down there by myself, have a nice cold glass of beer and walk home. That's the thing about all those investment books and people give advice armchair advice in how to save money or find shortcuts and life hacks in life. They ignore the importance of ceremony. And that's a very dramatic word, but ceremony is a gesture of difference. Hmm. So basically, if your routine is a cubicle, the ceremony is getting up, moving, fresh air, fresh landscape, fresh environment, talk to someone different, clear your head. I think your example of the pub is a perfect example that we can buy beer, buy a case, and take home in the fridge for half the price. Mm. But we go somewhere else for a change in venue, to see friends neutrally without our beloveds around, 
because we enjoy the ceremony of the pint being poured. We enjoy looking around us and seeing a few interesting characters or hot guys or girls or bits of conversation on the TV. Like, it's a ceremony of life. And if you boil everything down to the economics, you're living a life in a cabin, buying all your food and grog from Audi and not socialising. Yeah. It's the same reason why people go, well, why would you bother to cook? Because to cook, you could buy that food takeaway for the same price. Like, well, it's not all about the end result. It's all about sitting around the kitchen, talking to someone while you cook and getting the satisfaction of chopping up a fresh vegetable. Or yeah, It's a ceremony of preparation. Yeah. And it's about enjoying the journey, not there, just the destination. There's a, a bit of an inherent sort of feeling of accomplishment when you cook a nice meal as opposed to the ability to pay cash at a takeaway store for something. Anyway. Totally. If only everyone was like us, our emails would be so precise. Everyone would get the exact tone of our emails. <laughs> everyone would spend the right amount of money on coffee and make their own camper coffee in the kitchen to offset the uh, expense and we'd all find that sweet Is camper that sweet coffee spot. relationship with uh, the Portuguese or Spanish brand of shoes where you basically – For go looks for comfort? Yeah, totally. Yeah. That sums up my campers. Yeah. For function, not fashion. Well, tell me this. You asked a few leading questions there, and I think I walked into a few booby traps and I committed a few cardinal mistakes. So would you draft back to this infamous Daniel recipient? Are you a guy who writes Daniel, comma? Thank you. So you'd lead with Daniel, not a hi or a dear? I just don't like the hi. I do use it, but I feel dirty when I do. I just don't like it. I would rather be over a formal and a bit sort of aggressive passively. I just don't like the whole hi. I don't know. So what's your farewell? Kind regards. Kind. Not regards, not best. No, not- I'm a kind person. I have feelings and I respect the other person and I say, I wish you well. Okay, tell me this. This is the I mean, ultimate If test. I could use peace out. With a straight face, I probably would, but I can't. So. With the emoji of two fingers. Again, don't get me started, but the have a great day, smiley face emoji on an email in a work setting. Like, who does that? I mean, I get those. I probably get three of those a day. I don't agree with that, but there is the possibility to get benefit of the doubt to the sender. They're sending it from their iPhone or their Android phone. Ooh. And it has- really? People you still use this? Apparently so, 90%. And they use the peace out or the smiley face emoji. But here's the thing. I don't know how that translates to a Gmail or enterprise email system. Like the smiley face does translate, hmm. but I'm not sure about the one eye open, one eye closed, tongue out, Crazy face. Yeah, in the shit emoji, like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, does the full emoji come out as, like, a kind of combination of brackets and zeros and dots? Yeah, but so why is it okay to use a smiley face emoji So I in used, a work email? When so you- I used the smiley face the other day where I, I pretty much wanted to yell down the email, you fucking idiot, and mm. I had to correct someone. And I felt that whatever way I wrote it, it came across as passive aggressive, which it was. <laughs> slash condescending. Slash conde- And it was definitely condescending, but mm. it was correct. It was basically putting someone back in their place. And I think that five out of ten people would have actually been more harsh and said, no, you're wrong. But I can't express myself that way. I find that too harsh. So rather than do that, I said, thanks, but no thanks. And then I corrected and said, that's okay, I'll fix and deal with it. And I had a smiley emoticon, not emoji, so that it would translate cleanly whatever email system they were using. So I did like the colon and the bracket. Oh, yeah. Because I was writing on a keyboard. I want to make sure. Sorry, when I've said emoji before, I might have meant emoticon. So emoji is like the yellow smiley face on your iPhone. Yeah, we have talked about this before. Yeah, and emoticon so, is. Yeah. I'm sure like our listeners are very. Pre emoji. Very familiar with the. Yeah, uh, dedicated face. audience who are tracking every conversation. Yeah. So I, wrote, I did a smiley face because I wanted to be very clear that I wasn't being hostile and I was trying to just round the corners of my 
comment, mm. but I could have easily and justifiably said, fuck off, you're wrong, but I didn't want to do that with or without the fuck. <laughs> on, on your work email. On <laughs> work email. So I decided to basically not kill them with kindness, just correct and then do the smiley emoticon. As in, fuck you, smiley yeah. face. But mm. I feel the smiley emoticon isn't passive aggressive. And if it's interpreted that way, then you're fucked either way. Mm. But I figured that it was my way of saying I'm not being sarcastic or a smart ass. And this was to a professional person, but I felt that I had to put it in there. And I can actually spent 15 minutes deliberating, and this is, I guess, how you and I differ from many people, for better or worse, that we will actually agonise over the nuances of the written form to ensure that we convey it as accurately as possible. Because I actually didn't want to cause disharmony, I didn't want to cause offence. So I was trying to massage the conversation, whereas I think someone else would just have sent the email without the smiley emoticon. I read it, I interpret it badly, and so it goes. What do you think about the brevity of the email when you just go, please see attached, and that's it? Hate it. Right. So do you want to see, please see attached, what I've done in this document is I've done this and I've done that and and you'll see that I've done this and that, and then... No, it, no, it I think there's this. a halfway. I think you can just say, I'd say, hi, you wouldn't. I'd say, hi, Daniel, please be attached with a few suggested amendments. And this is my other learning use of particular vernacular. I always write suggested. Yeah. So I say suggested because what I'm actually really saying is do this. I'm but saying, I- I'm saying do this, but... Put your brain in gear, and if you want to make an argument as to why you shouldn't do this, you can let me know. 100%. Yeah. And I say suggested that they feel this faux sense of choice so they don't feel they're being told what to do. But also so that they feel like, oh, maybe I should read this myself and work it out for myself because- Because they're liable. Yeah. 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 Because it's suggested, not yeah. instructed. So, therefore, yeah. they have to read it and agree opposed to just- accepting without consideration and go yeah. on. And so my attitude is always, yeah, hi, Daniel, please see attached with suggested amendments. And I always sign off almost every email I send to any artist or bureaucrat or suit with please don't hesitate to email slash call to discuss, which is a friendly way of saying if you're confused, you disagree, you don't understand, Give me a holler. But it's also saying, I've given you all the help I can. I'm giving you the offer to come back to me. But if you don't take me up on that, it's your fault. 100%. And so that's how I get stuff across to them in that way. I think that's a good strategy. And I do adopt that with a slightly different sign off, but it basically means the same thing. What's your version? I'd say so and so, comma, thank you. I've reviewed the X document. And my comments are below, colon, insert comments, new line. Please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or would like to discuss. Yeah, by offering them the opportunity to ask a question, if they don't, then you've kind of extinguished any conversation mm. that has to occur. They can't come back and say, but, 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 but. You've said, this is your window to contribute or mm. concede slash agree. Yeah. And it's like, normally I don't hear from them for weeks and then they go, oh, but that thing you said, and I'm like, oh, okay. I've done like 150 of them <laughs> since then. Which one was it? <laughs> so I've got a sign-off on all of my phones and iPads, which is the same. The brevity thing. Yep. So if I ask you to recall it now, can you remember? Something like, sent from my iPhone, apologies for thumb slash typos and brevity or something. Yeah, that's pretty good. Here it is. This is what I have that comes from my phone or iPad. Quote, sent from my phone, brackets, with apologies for brevity and inadvertent thumb typos, close brackets, full stop. There you go. So I use that as my catch-all. Essentially, that's my way of someone not complaining about me being brusque, short, yeah, to the point. Yeah, I think it's good to say brevity because yeah, like it's like the tone. Tone is everything, and you get 
oh, oh geez, you're a bit stroppy. It's like, well, no, I'm on the bus. I'm about to get off and yeah. I just had to quickly say. And that's mm, totally my yeah. intention. My intention is to basically, with that signature block, have them imagine me on my phone totally. typing on the on the run and rather than them being pissed off, I want them to be appreciative they even got a response. So rather than going, oh, it's a bit short, like a bit cranky, it's like, yeah. no, 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 it's yeah. like you were lucky to get a response and I'm happy to respond to you, but it's above and beyond what you should expect. I think that's totally fair and reasonable. Well, it saved my bacon many a time. And on that note, mate, I think we should um, farewell ourselves. Stick a bow on this bad boy and send it off to bed. <laughs> <laughs> With apologies for brevity and uh, some typos. Nice. Peace out. See ya. Night, mate. Oh, 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 oh,